So we've heard already a lot about trust today from magicians, philosophers, journalists, and judges, and from scientists, from scientists who study trust. What I'll do is I'll turn this around, and instead of talking about the science of trust, I'll talk about trusting science and about how important it is to trust science. More specifically, what I'll argue is that society will benefit from science only if we trust fundamental, that is basic science, by giving it freedom to explore. And I'll illustrate my point using brain science, which is all around us, isn't it? In primary schools, we have amygdala corners named after the emotional center in our brain. We have self-help books of baby, adolescent, and elderly brains. We have pictures of brain images all over the newspapers. We love brain science, don't we? And we do so for good reasons, not least to satisfy our curiosity. After all, the biology of the mind is fascinating. Personally, my journey began in school when someone close to me started hallucinating, developed schizophrenia. I wondered, how can it be that someone would hear or see stuff that is not really there? People love brain science. Another good reason for loving brain science is because it will have an extraordinary impact on our future society. In fact, it's already been shown to be outstandingly useful. Consider the example of deep brain stimulation, a technique where needles are inserted deep inside someone's head to turn behavior on or off. This is not science fiction. Ask any patient with Parkinson's disease. He'll know about it if he hasn't undergone it himself. Deep brain stimulation is now a well-accepted treatment for Parkinson's disease. Now watch this patient who suffers from severe trembling of his upper limbs, of his arms and hands. One of the key symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Now watch the same patient a bit later, after his neurologist has turned on his uh, deep brain stimulator in the next video. His trembling is completely gone by turning on leads in his head. Isn't that amazing? Now, one thing I want you to notice here, and why this is relevant will become clear in a bit, is that this treatment came about from fundamental, basic brain science, became possible only because a bunch of curious scientists wanted to know how the brain works. We all love brain science, don't we? Or actually, do we? Turns out there's also a lot of criticism, actually, a lot of skepticism about our brain culture, a culture in which we tend to extrapolate brain science to, to pretty much anything in society, be it education, law, medicine, politics, economics, marketing, religion, pretty much anything. What we see is an increasing emphasis on brains in our society, an increasing fascination for that organ that enables us to understand our minds. But what we also see is an increasing skepticism, a growing skepticism about this emphasis on brains in our society. Is a better understanding of how our brain works really that useful for us? For us? Is it that relevant to society? Today's scientists, and brain scientists in particular, they're out there. They talk to the public and they reach out to industry. Um, they're encouraged by society to talk out. We see this happening very clearly in today's government science policy, with an ever-growing emphasis on valorization, public-private initiatives, and demand-driven research. What we see is a shift in political policy that values applied science over fundamental science. But let's get back to this criticism, this skepticism. Scientists reach out to society. Turns out that that hasn't always helped them. Some people now argue that they're dangerous. Dangerous to psychiatry, because they reduce human beings to their brains. 
dangerous in court and in schools because they do away with free will and with responsibility. Dangerous to society because with their so-called neuromyths or neurobollocks, they spread misconceptions and make promises that are out of proportion or that cannot be realized. This skepticism, I believe, partly reflects the fact that the field is young. Yet, I think we should take them seriously, these neurocritics, these neuroskeptics, and we should do that because they have a point. There are neuromyths out there. There is pseudo-brain science out there. Consider the example of brain-based lie detection. There's now a number of companies gone fully commercial, some led by scientists, that claim that we can use brain scans to detect lies, for lie detection. Now, this is utter nonsense. We cannot use brain scans to detect lies. The technique is simply unreliable. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that brain science is useless. What I'm saying is that expectations have been set too high. The brain is an incredibly complex organ, and there's no way that brain science will enable us to detect lies in any near future. The key question, then, is why do people make such false promises, right? And the thing that I think is relevant here is that they are increasingly encouraged to reach out to society, to be useful to society. Yeah, we see this, as I just pointed out, in today's government science policy. We see a shift in political policy from applied to fundamental science. Now, encouraging scientists to reach out to the public, as we do here, is clearly a good thing. We should get out of our ivory towers. We should share our discoveries with the public, as we do on forums like these. We should be aware of the problems that society faces today. But we should not have too much of a good thing. The more society requires scientists to be useful, the more scientists will justify their science based on direct applications. The thing is, the problem is, we cannot know in advance of making discovery what the impact of that discovery will be. Discoveries, by definition, go beyond what we know already. As such, uh, requiring, forcing scientists to be directly useful will actually, somewhat paradoxically, restrict creative discovery. In addition, it will also generate, uh, or stimulate, I should say, the generation of neuromyths, of pseudoscience, and ultimately of skepticism. Just go back to the example of deep brain stimulation. Do you think that the scientists that made the original discoveries that enabled, ultimately, deep brain simulation, were aware of the radical impact of their discoveries? Absolutely not. Simple analogy from a different field. Do you think that the scientists that laid the groundwork for the transistor, you know, that revolutionized the field of electronics, were aware of the iPad? No, they couldn't have known about that. Frankly speaking, my own experiments are not directly applicable to society. My work is driven by curiosity about how the brain works, about why some people hear and see stuff that is not really there. It is not driven by its direct applications. By focusing excessively on direct applications, we will actually get rid of innovation. Application comes after discovery, not before discovery. As such, applied science will always depend critically on fundamental, basic science. So my take-home message is simple. If we want society to benefit from science, we better have faith in fundamental science, in basic science, and give it freedom to explore. <laughs>